Hello, everybody. My name is Dick Larson. Delighted you joined us today. It's my pleasure to uh, be here sitting, talking with uh, Dr. Dan Berg. And um, he has been a pillar in the area of systems and operations research and service of science and other things. And so we want you to get to know him. And uh, he and I have known each other for many, many years. Uh, Dr. James Tian, who is now uh, at University of Miami, where uh, Dr. Berg is. Both of them came from RPI before, so I've known them both for a long time. And uh, Dan, it's delighted. I'm delighted to be here with you today. And basically, this is your show. We want, we want you to tell the story to the uh, INFORMS community about your life and about how you got involved with service science and OR and these sorts of things. But I guess what we're supposed to start with is you know, the basic facts, like, like where you were born, uh, what you remember mm -hmm. about, about childhood, and, and how you eventually gravitated uh, uh, to science and these sorts of things. Okay. Um, I was born in New York City, and there's a, an interesting reason why. This is a joke coming on. You have to, <laughs> I wanted to be near my mother. Okay. Ah, Old joke. very nice. Yeah. I was born in New York City. Uh, my family, I lived uh, outside New York City in Connecticut for a good part of my life, but I went to school, grade school, and I went to high school. I had to travel a long way to go to a high school called Stuyvesant. Uh, That's a very famous high school. It is very One famous. One of the most famous in the country. Yeah, it is very famous, uh, deservedly so because James Cagney was a graduate of, of, <laughs> of Simonson High School. It's a, uh, you have to pass a, a pretty uh, good test to get into it. Yeah. When I went there, it was an all boy school. And uh, it, it's a very small school and they could not do all the sessions at once. So it was a split session. Uh, for my first year uh, since I'd gone to junior high school, uh, I had to literally uh, get up around 5.30 in the morning, take a uh, train. Uh, it was at 14th Street and 1st Avenue. Since then, they've built a fantastic school uh, near uh, on the other side of Manhattan, lower Manhattan, fairly close to the World Trade Center, which they had to shut down yeah. after the uh, attack. Uh, in any event, the last two years of the, uh, excuse me, the first year was from one o'clock to 5.30 in the afternoon. The, the two uh, junior and senior years were from 8 a.m. to 12.30. Oh uh, so, uh, I, w I was known in my neighborhood for going to bed at 8 a.m. in order to, have, to get my eight and a half hours of sleep. I have some MIT well, faculty colleagues who routinely still behave that way. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and now I'm known for taking a a nap and showing up late for <laughs> a taping. So, were, so were your parents very supportive, or did you have siblings? Oh, I, and, uh, yeah. I was the youngest of four brothers. Oh boy. Okay, and I was known as Baby Dan. Baby Dan. <laughs> okay, and my three elder brothers were very protective. Uh, they it was at an age where they they. Uh, got involved in the war, yeah. and, and uh, I was a young kid. So, so you obviously got interested in science early yes, on. Yes, right, exactly. And, and I, I looked at your background. I didn't know, actually, your, your advanced degrees. I guess you went to Yale? I went to Yale for my PhD yeah. in physical chemistry. Physical chemistry, yeah. yeah. Tell oh, us yeah. about that choice. Okay, and uh, I was always interested in science. And, uh, I'll tell you, if I may, a little bit about my parents. Uh, they, my father, who worked in Connecticut, even when we lived in New York, he would leave 
early uh, Monday morning and come back late uh, Friday night. He worked in Shilton, Connecticut, and in uh, Danbury, Connecticut. He was, uh, in both places, he was the plant manager for partners in, who owned the plant. So he worked for others until, uh, I think it was the mid-late 1930s when they sunk everything they had into a plant of his own. Oh. I should tell you, the, the plant owners had, there were three, Mr. Pepper, Mr. Salter, and Mr. Shaker. And You've I got kid, to be kidding. And me. I kid you not. You've got to be kidding. No, me. it's a true story. Wow. Uh, but eventually, uh, they sunk literally every penny they had and started a plant of their own with my mother working full time as the taking care of the books yeah. and my father working very hard assembling the factory, getting the plant going. And what age were you at this time? Uh, uh, approximately? I must have been eight years old, wow. seven years old, something like that. Uh, and uh, the, uh, and there's stories attached to that, stories that did me in very good set, set state uh, to earn extra money. I was on a 25 cent allowance. Enough See, to get to a movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To get any extra money. You had to earn yourself. I had to earn yeah, it yeah. for my... So even though your parents were very busy, they spent a lot of time and energy with you, and yeah, they motivated yeah. you to be a hard worker. They, yes. And they were... Uh, my father would give me odd jobs just to pay me. Uh, More than like a quarter. painting exit signs in his factory. The other thing, which was really a good education for me, uh, you know, it was one of those cases where my, I, my father was a lot smarter than I thought, okay, as it turns out. Um, at that time, there was absolutely no air conditioning, and it was a hot factory during the summer. And he would send me out to carry back cold soda for the men and women on the production line. And he would go up and down the line offering whatever he wanted. Yeah, yeah. And I, in my naivete, stupidity, whatever you want to call it, asked him one day, I, I don't get this, you own this plant, this is your plant, what, what are you doing? giving out soda. And he answered, and it stuck with me, he, the dumb number four son, <laughs> okay. These people are on incentive payment. They get paid for their output as well as the time put in to the production. They don't want to take a break. Uh, and you don't want the, them to get sick either because of the heat, right? Yeah. yeah. They, the more they earn means the more we produce and the more eat we earn. Win-win. And the more we earn, the more I can afford your allowance. <laughs> so that, even if it was only 25 cents. <laughs> even if it was 25 cents. Okay, so let's advance further. Now, did your father's plant play any role in your deciding to f study physical chemistry? Uh, I don't think so, although he would have me, uh, uh, when I got a little older, help him with the, uh, the accounting books. Mother was no longer doing that. This was to prepare the books to go to a professional accountant. Okay. So you think you go to a management school then instead? No, well, <laughs> it was, I, I was precocious in math, yeah. uh, and they were very encouraging. I remember my mother asked me what I wanted for Christmas, 
and I said a chemical laboratory. Really? Yeah. At what age were you then? More or less uh, again? Eight or nine or ten? No, it must have been twelve. Twelve or something yeah, like that. Yeah. And she had me design such a thing. Remember this is in a, in a fairly big apartment in the city. And she went to a lumberyard with me, and he built it. So I had a laboratory. And you didn't do any experiments which causes explosions? Oh, yes, I did when they weren't around. <laughs> and uh, the story with that. Uh, so that's how you got your interest in physical chemistry? Yeah, I think that's an experiment where it came yeah. from. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I hung out with a group of teenagers that were uh, somewhat like me. Well, actually two groups. Some street smart teenagers. And others who were And others who were more More science bookish. math. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, I remember it was, you know, must have been when I was 11 or 12, uh, asking my father for uh, $5 for chemicals. That's a lot of money in those days. Yes, it was. And he, you know, smiled. And he was doing very well at that point. Yeah. Successful. Yeah. And he asked me, how can you spend $5 on chemicals? And I answered, uh, I could do it because I had a rich father. That's what you told him? That's what I told him. I, he, he was a jokester too. <laughs> and he said, here's 10. Here's $10. Oh, okay. isn't that nice? And that routine then worked from then on. Yeah. Okay, we had, we had a little. Okay, so let's advance a little bit now. So. Uh, you go to Yale, you get uh, degrees, including a PhD in physical chemistry. Yes. And, um, and but why don't you get then, let, let's, since this is an informs uh, interview, we want to get, yes. we, we want to get, get, we want to get in that yes. direction. But we want, we need to know a little bit about your career trajectory, yeah. about how you spent, oh, okay. if I remember correctly, you spent the first part of your career basically in physical chemistry, right. and then you migrated off and eventually got into informs yes. types of okay. things. So could um, you give us a little bit about yeah, that? Yeah, well, I'll give yeah. you that. Okay. Let me tell you one interesting aspect. Uh, uh, when I entered Yale, my first semester there, my brother took me to see my uncle, who was a millionaire. And this was deliberate. This was over, again, over Christmas vacation my first semester at Yale. And the uncle who had become a millionaire when he was in his young 20s by being the only importer of beaded in, in the 20s, in the 1920s, the women wore dresses with bead, wooden beads at the bottom to hold the dress down. I and think a, I've seen pictures of these things. And the popular yeah. attachment with it was pocketbooks made of wooden beads made in Czechoslovakia. And he imported those. And he imported those. And made he a was fortune. the exclusive importer. Whoa. And he made a fortune. In any event, he wanted to see me over Christmas. And uh, this was... I know what was going to happen. Okay, he took me to a fancy lunch and then asked me how, uh, he, he didn't understand PhD. He was uh, a smart in the head, but not academic mm -hmm. guy. How could he accelerate my research program was basically what he was asking. 
Yeah. And I said, if I could work that summer and get started with my research program, that would accelerate me. And he asked me, how much would it cost? I knew that was coming. And guess what the number was? $1,000. It was 300 bucks. $300? Yeah, this was, remember, I'm an old guy. This was 1950. And it was $300 at Yale for room and board. Amazing. Okay. And he paid for it. He slips $300 into my pocket. I take it out and give it back to him. And we play that game till, till I... So that, so that accelerated your Yale so career. So I started my yeah. research program that, that fall, my thesis advisor got an ONR grant for, uh, we, we were doing a, a very interesting, relates to MIT, using wartime radar equipment to get high voltage pulses to measure the conductivity of solutions, electrolytic solutions, confirming Anzaga's theory and then applying it to a place where it was never done before, and that's carbon dioxide and water, to determine the true dissociation constant of carbonic acid. It turns out when you put CO2 in water, most of it is CO2 just dissolved, and at room temperature only 0.7% forms, actually reacts with the water to form H2O plus CO2 to H2CO3. And all the handbooks at that time, they probably even today, gave the acidity of carbonic acid as a very weak acid. If you look at the structure, it shouldn't be. It should be stronger than vinegar, acetic acid. Uh, and, and uh, any chemist looking at the molecule would say that because in acetic acid, a methyl group, CH3 actually, is replaced by hydrogen to form carbonic acid. And that would mean more hydrogen. You would think it would be more acidic. Okay, so I think the audience know, yeah. will say that you're an expert in chemistry. No, no, and, well, and, physical chemistry yeah, yeah. and in theory. But, but what we, in, theory. Oh, in theory too. Okay, so what we want to move, we want to move yeah, toward okay. the toward the informs kind of thing. Okay. So, I'm, so I'm interested in what your career was after you graduated. Right. Well, and, this you know. doing this with my getting the grant, I got off being a TA of the physical chemistry lab, where I have to tell you one of my students was Roberto Gorizetta, who became president of Coca Cola, was a student in my laboratory. But okay, so I, I got through my PhD in three years, amazing. publishing six papers. Even more amazing. And with a proof of the theory and doing it to determine something that is vitally important, the true dissociation constant. So now my thesis, one of my thesis professors suggested I go to Westinghouse where they were looking for electrical that guy. Was, that's Pittsburgh, right? In Pittsburgh. Yeah, yeah. That's where I went. Okay, and that's where I met my wife. Uh, I became, uh, this relates to my, uh, I was very inventive, uh, full of publishing. I rose in the hierarchy. I became director of research for is this how is this how you got involved with Carnegie Mellon University? Exactly, also? exactly. Bingo. Dick, you've done your homework. Bingo. I knew that. <laughs> uh, they sent me on. I say it with a smile. An executive program at Carnegie Mellon, and in the executive program, Dick Seyert, who was becoming, who was dean of GSIA, if you remember, graduate was becoming, school for industrial administration. Exactly. Okay, and it's really the engineering school for IE. Right, right. Uh, founded by the Mellons. 
1948, something like that. Uh, Dick asked me to critique his course, and I, and he was very good at taking criticism. As I critique his course, saying, "You taught a very good course in strategy. I was using it; it was useful." Uh, he said, "But I said, right?" But so was this like corporate strategy? This or? was. Yeah, it was basically corporate strategy. So now he's taking you out of physical chemistry, oh, pure, oh, yeah. and I, totally I was, now yeah, in the systems. I'm a manager. And, You're a manager, okay. Yeah, but taking courses, still publishing, still a productive researcher, but I was... But uh, you're developing that tie to Carnegie Mellon. Yes, yeah, and yeah. he then says, when I said, you did not mention the role of technology in strategic management and here this used to be Carnegie Institute of Technology, the technology yeah, and yeah. just recently became Carnegie Mellon University, U University. Uh, that was Guy Stever right. that's another story so uh, at one time did you then totally leave Westinghouse to go to Carnegie Mellon well, at, at that point no but the plot thickens he then says you know you're right Dan come teach a class come teach a class in the strategic management, technological innovation. So I started teaching at GSIA, a course in what I thought they were lacking. And, and being down there one day, now teaching in the program that I was in, as well as a credit course, someone saw me when they were looking for a dean, and Dick got wind of this, and said, why didn't I think of it? Dan, come be dean of the Mellon College of Science. This Would is you? an incredible story because you kind of weren't recruited as an official faculty member. You were kind of they had this liaison exactly. with the industry, and, and then they realized all your talents. They said, come be dean. Uh, yeah. And you were also a provost there too, weren't you? Yeah, I became provost it became after provost. becoming dean. But at that time, Dick, uh, so many little tidbits. Uh, Westinghouse had done something fantastically stupid just before this. Yeah. Now I was teaching, teaching there several years. They had committed 80 million pounds of uranium fuel. I was not a nuclear guy, okay? And in the end of 75, 76, they, uh, they had control of 15 million pounds and they had committed 80 million pounds for nuclear reactors. Mm. They were short, 65 million pounds. Mm. The price of uranium oxide went from 850 a pound to 43.50 a pound, My goodness. like that. Okay. Because of their commitment? No, because it turns out there was a cartel. We didn't know that at the time. There was a cartel fixing the price. Rio Tinto, Canadian cartel. They asked me literally just be again, just before Christmas to chair a committee to, for the corporation to think of all the ways of getting below market price uranium. Legally. Legally, of course, <laughs> of course. Uh, they came January, they formed a new company, and he asked me to leave my research director's job to be technical director of this new company. What was it called? Uh, Uranium Resources. Uranium Very Resources, novel. yeah. Right. Okay. First job, it relates. Fantastic. First job was to follow up one of our crazy ideas. So. I'm on the corporate plane with our chairman of the board to go to the State Department. When you make, you enrich uranium, okay, the uranium, when you find it in the ground, it's 0.7% U-235. For running in a nuclear reactor, you have to get it up to 3, 4%. To get it for weapons, you have to get it up much higher, 
It's a classified number. For submarine reactors, you get it up to 90%. 90%. So you're taking a lot of U-235.7% and going through that time a diffusion plant. Yep. Today it's centrifuge. So this is an example of where both your newly emerging management system skills yeah. and your chemical yes. skills got together. Yeah, and, and it was uh, R&D development, getting plants in operation. And the reason I couldn't take the dean's job, I thought, is this is a year later, they are after me for dean. I'm still doing the course. I'm now teaching at night in a graduate program, the nuclear fuel cycle. See, so they asked you to be dean when you were still a full-time employee. Exactly. You're, you're head of this your right. uranium company. And the, after the first year, my boss says, uh, he, he's giving me the biggest raise I've ever gotten percentage-wise, yeah. 25%, saying, Dan, you did exactly what I needed to do. I'm working on the legal cases. I'm off to Africa. Uh, you're taking care of the plants. I, I've had no worry because you were doing what had to be done, and you've done it. Yeah. And uh, I had spoken to my wife at that time saying, this job is a mo one more year job because the plants are going to come in. I have nothing to do yeah. after the first three acts, three different kinds of plants that we're putting in the production. So you did that, and then you left, you left no, this company? Then, then, then my boss says, Dan, you get an A plus, and here's a raise to match it. A year from now, you're going to be out of a job. But I'm not going to let you go for that other year. I don't care who wants you in Westinghouse. I don't care what. You're in this job another year. And I said, you got it. I'm committed. Along comes Dick Seyert, and here's my stupidity again, saying, Dan, I want you to come as dean. Can't, I don't want to talk to you, Dick. Not interest. Come see me. Have lunch with me. Okay. Come see him. Why don't you want to talk to me? I made this commitment. We'll wait, he says. You wait a year. I wasn't used to that in industry. Yeah. If you turn down a job, bye bye. Who's next on the list? Okay. So that's so, what happened. So you so waited a year, waited, and a year later you year, became dean. I made the switch. Okay. Now is that when? Because I look at your resume, and there's a distinct difference. There's a, a, a bunch of uh, like physical chemistry, chemistry types of science things. Yeah. Then all of a sudden you kind of switch to systems. Yes. Is this about the time that that happened? Uh, or maybe a no. little bit later after that? No, I, I, both through the course I teach, which is uh, management of technological innovation. That's a systems issue. You yeah. just don't have a good idea, and there's an innovation. Yeah. It takes finance, chemical plants, uh, 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 planning, uh, uh, planning, new technology, everything, uh, all all the above. Yeah. So, to get something from the idea yeah. to the economy yeah. is a systems idea. So I was always comfortable. With, with that. that. So your systems kind of emerged naturally from the, this other background? Yes, I, I would say I was working where you had to work in a system, yeah. you had to understand the system, you had to know the weak points of the system, you had to know how to go from A to Z in that system to be successful. Yeah. Okay, so uh, and um, so then let's go to but, where you go to move to Carnegie Mellon. But, now. So now I'm at Carnegie Mellon. Great. Okay. And you're dean. And I'm dean. And I'm dean of. For my first six months, not knowing how the system works, the, the uh, head of biology resigned before I got there. So I said, I'll be head of biology. I didn't know. It was just to see how the system worked yeah. in Carnegie Mellon, the financial system, uh, the educational system, as being a department chair. Yeah. Okay. And, and uh, with the deans, 
the dean of engineering was very helpful to me. And I was a new guy, you know, but I didn't know the culture. I didn't, okay, any event. So now were you still, were you, were you doing research now at this time, more in the systems area? Were you I publishing, was doing research were publishing in that area? With, and it turns out with a guy who became dean of engineering, who was in the electrical engineering department, he, he was, uh, he, he had his own motive in that he was uh, trying to, to bet on a new horse. Okay, I was a new guy in town, and he was a department chair, and he was currying, both currying favor, and I had something to offer in a program he already had. So I was continuing to do research on his grant. Okay. Okay. Um, the, but the, the key thing that I did, which was doable, because of the talents that were there, was in computer science. They were doing work in artificial intelligence well, that's and kind of robotics. Where, from an MIT point of view, it's, it's horrible for me to say this, but I think that's where AI was born. It's yes, not Carnegie well, Mellon Herb, University. Herb, Herb, Herb Simon. Simon. Herb Simon, that's said, right. They had an idea, Raj Reddy, I don't know if you know that name. I do. You'll, if you, Okay, he's connected with the medal you're going to re receive soon, Dick. Okay. We'll, we'll get to that. Raj Reddy, who was a, and is a fantastic guy and a fantastic researcher and knows how to get the system handled and done, yeah. uh, had this idea to form a robotics institute. They needed, this is in 19, I want to get the exact date, 70, 78, 79, yeah. just been there, Carnegie Mountain. Oh, if I can backtrack, this is pertinent to us. I go on this trip to, to uh, State Department. The chairman of Westinghouse, who's with me, remember this is my first trip First time at Gateway Corporate Headquarters. We fly on a corporate jet, and this is all, all new all to you. me. Yeah, yeah. This is before Reagan Airport, but we were met by our limousine to take us to the State Department. But before we go, he says, how about some lunch? I was glad he asked, because I couldn't bring it up. Okay, chairman of the board. So we, I see he eats a hamburger, Hey, this guy is human. Okay. <laughs> we go to the State Department and he says, let's take a walk around the block. We have a little time. Fine, let's take a walk around the block. We pass the National Academy. He says, what's this building? The NAS, National Academy, the National Academy of Science. National Academy, that time National Academy of Science right. and Engineering yeah. Institute of Medicine. Right. What's that about? I tell him Abraham Lincoln, 1862, three, whatever, formed it to give advice to the government. It's not a government agency. Well, you know, you know the routine. And we, okay. We give the presentation to the, I give the presentation the State Department uh, to get Russian tails because Russians, when they run their system, they come out with end product that's 0.25 uranium. Still useful. We, yeah, they, we, it's like squeezing a damp sponge. Yeah, yeah still useful. We come out with 0.2, so they, they're throwing away some stuff the and our system is still usable. Yeah. So this is the height of the Cold War, that we're going to import the tailings to get uranium, which could be used for weapons okay. or for nuclear plants. Okay. That was a crazy idea. Okay. Since the war, we buy their enriched uranium to loot it, to loot it. So it was a, a good idea, wrong time. But OK, okay. we so go okay. back to the office, fly back after this. There's a letter. I just got elected to the NAE. 
You. Yeah. That's when you were elected to the NAE. That's when I was elected to the yeah, NAE. Fantastic. And I'm, of course, elated. Okay. And it's, a great up. it's a great accomplishment. Yeah. I great call him up. And I was still a young guy. Yeah. Call him up. Mr. Wilcox, you, did you know? You, know you, you were questioning me. You must have known this. You know, <laughs> they, they know everything. He didn't. He okay. didn't know. It was a no. surprise to so what a coincidence. He asked what that building was, and later that day you found out you were exactly. in the Exactly, and of course, um, thrilled, yeah, you know. Now Just you've me. had many, many awards during your life. Is that the uh, one you're proudest of, or is there, which, is, which award uh, are you proudest of? Well, it's certainly one, and it certainly, you know, brings a smile, the yeah. memory, and the incident of going with him, you know, all, yeah. all the rest. Uh, so we, we we want to kind of so, advance yeah, now, now, given now, our yeah, yeah. moving along, moving our to, agenda <laughs> to to. Uh, so I'm now at the uh, Carnegie Mellon, still teaching in GSIA. Yeah. Know all the people. I know the members. I didn't know at that time. It was before Informs. I know all the people who are members of, today of Informs. Yeah. Uh, and you know, I knew the economists. I worked uh, in the program that I was at earlier with a guy who won the Nobel, uh, Bob Lucas, if you remember that name, won the Nobel Prize for in economics. So I was in, involved in GSIA, even be, while I was still at Westinghouse, even before. Well, GSIA and what it's evolved into has been a major in operations research, yes. management science. You look at Al Bloomstein, who, yeah, yeah, who and, I knew and, then. And example. And I know. Yeah, and so that really is a, brings up. These are all friends it, before. Yeah, this is part of the bridge we're looking for. Yeah, to, that, to that's the, a connection. That's to the one OR of the part kind of thing. Right, and uh, of course, to say it straight now, the, the transition, now the intellectual transition, uh, I would say that technological innovation and, and uh, the systems approach is part of informs. It's you know they, there there are meetings on on this sessions on this. So I'm comfortable informs without what I then did, but then I did something that more directly connects. Uh, and this is. Uh, while I'm at uh, uh, transition to, uh, as provost to RPI, where provost to provost job. Yeah, you were provost at Carnegie Mellon first, right? I was right? provost at Carnegie Mellon, yeah. uh, having formed the Robotics Institute. Yeah. Then you go to RPI. Then Rensselaer Polytechnic later Institute. Later I became provost at RPI. The, the guy who's president is George Lowe, who headed up the Apollo program, okay, who unfortunately dies, uh, gets ill uh, with a recurrent melanoma and dies prematurely. And I become president. Having served as president, I then become post-president, a faculty member. At RPI. I'm, at RPI. Yeah. Uh, I'm still a, a relatively young guy. And all the time you're writing papers, too. I, all the time I'm writing yeah. papers. And, and getting more awards. Yeah. I've, I've, seen, the, yeah. I've seen the file. Okay. <laughs> uh, the question then is, what do I want to do as an academic? Mm. And I applied the lessons I, that I teach and learn on strategic planning. I drew the Venn diagram, I, I kept it, took a picture of it when I moved my office, of what it had to be for me to work as an academic, as a full-time, not administrator, mm. as a, a full-time PhD producing, professor. teaching professor. professor. I was an institute professor. Okay. Uh, the uh, uh, in my title, even when I was president, was uh, 
Institute Professor of Science and Technology. That's a so pretty, tech, pretty big umbrella. Right. Very important. Right. Yeah. This is around 1988, 87, 88. And I do a little bit of literature search. I talk to people and I conclude I went on sabbatical a little bit later at University of Penn, and I conclude that the academic community, with the exception of the marketing academic community, had neglected the service sector. That's when you got involved with the service sector. Exactly. It was a choice. This is the late 80s. Late 80s. You, were, you were one of the first people to, to recognize that. Exactly. Okay. Because I think the NAE didn't recognize it until about 10 years later. Oh, I was involved in that. Yeah. Okay. And I was involved with, with uh, several other things. Because I was involved in the NAE. I was head of the uh, Educational Advisory Committee for the NAE. Yeah. And I was pushing the service sector. You know, I found that, you know, the Venn diagram, incidentally, yeah. had to be something that was academic, publishable in, in top journals, uh, something that connected to the, my technology background, something that uh, would contribute to the service sector. Which Obviously. is about 80% of the of US economy. It was, uh, it, and now 82%, it was high 70s yeah. then, yeah. still grown a little bit. Uh, and, you know, I had it, uh, the, the other advantage was this really, uh, from my search, it was, was this really neglected by what I call the engineering community? I saw that there were a lot of papers, not a lot, a few papers, where the community was using uh, some of the attributes in engineering and planning uh, to do what I call marketing. Marketing, yeah. yeah. It was. It was dominated by the marketing community. But services as a topic of study, right? Both science and engineering was right. uh, was ignored, right? Relatively so, right? The the place I went to for sabbatical a little bit later was Penn I had a little group with. Uh, uh, this is a guy, uh, the guy who is now the uh, head of the Philadelphia. Uh, oh boy, uh, the the uh, uh, management science. No, 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 no. This is the uh, the the finance for the for the com country. Oh, uh, you know him, uh, a guy who's a, I think a fellow. In in, uh, in 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 forms, uh, uh, Patrick uh, Pat Harker. Pat Harker. Harker. Pat right. Harker. Yeah, Pat Harker. Pat Harker took over the group. Yeah. Okay, and and he was there, head of the service center, and I think that was the only place, you know, in the country in Pat part engine. So there was a little bit of it going on, yeah. but that's when I made the switch and. Lo and behold, I got the group I was in at RPI to get interested in Jim Tien. Jim Tien. And I- Also a member of the NAE. Oh, also a member of the NAE, a member of uh, Informs, oh. fellow. We wrote a paper which applied the systems approach to, to services. The services. Such an obvious paper, mm. now, conceptually, of course, right. the most popular thing I've ever written. Wow. Okay? Amazing. So it just shows you, you know, it's, uh, it, it, I, I, take, I don't take credit for robotics other than I was the guy who got the money, five million bucks. Dick Sire, the president, wouldn't let us do anything until we had the money. So I take credit, 
but it was not my idea. The, the best thing I did with robotics was choosing where I was ready, who did a fantastic job, and being the conduit to get the money. Yeah. So but in the service sector, that was done with thought. Yeah. That was planned. But I think you know one lesson that, that people who are listening to you might take out here is that most people think of, 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 of folks who have a career in operations, research, management, science, whatever informs this, because yeah. there's so many different things these days, as starting and studying your PhD in that area and kind of working in that silo for their lives. You came from a totally different approach. You, you, yeah. you, you studied uh, chemistry first, physical chemistry, and you went and worked for Westinghouse, so, and you became an academic almost by accident. Now, I mean, not yeah. by accident, but well, they observed your talents well, and skills and said, we want to take you away from industry, and you become uh, leaders in, in major research universities, and then you migrate into OR in a general sense, rather than some narrow, technocratic, theorem-proof right. point of view. As I say, well, for, first of all, Dick, your statement was Dick Syert's selling statement to me. Dan, you're really an academic. You, <laughs> you belong in the universe, yeah. et cetera. Yeah. Uh, and I was comfortable. I was teaching two courses. I mean, it was two adjunct professors yeah. in engineering and in GSIA. And uh, I would also say I was always uh, quantitatively oriented. Okay. But I, I look at the papers that you've written, authored and co-authored, and the, the titles are so diverse and so amazing, it's almost incredible to think that one individual could become expert and contribute in so many things. And could I ask you, before we go on yeah. now to service science here at, in Informs, one thing that struck me, I did see you talked about power women in one of your papers. Do you remember that? Oh, oh yeah. And what, I'm, just, what, yeah. I'm just curious as to what that was about. Well, we had a, a um, thought, what we, the thought was, uh, and we called the technique uh, with tongue in cheek, but it makes a point. Yeah. We used other people's databases and extracted uh, from their data when they were doing something else. Yeah. The connections to the service sector. So they were doing, you know, they were looking for the top power women in industry or whatever. Oh, and somehow from this you could ferret out the power women in services? Exactly. Oh. Uh, okay, so we call this <clears throat> surface mining because it wasn't deep. It was getting at the concept with a database that was reliable, that somebody had spent a lot of money and a lot of effort for getting. Yeah. And we were saying, is there any insight into the service sector? So it's kind so, of like early data mining. It <laughs> was, it was, that's why we call it surface, yeah. like surface mining. Yeah. In the coal industry, you know, there's surface coal, where you don't go into a mine. And so we were being tongue in cheek, but gathering knowledge about the service area uh, that people were neglecting. So we were able to, till we got tired of, of uh, doing this, we, we kept looking for good databases. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so, so let's get to the OR management science point. Yep. So, so the folks watching our interview today, how would you like them to think about you as a contributor to INFORMS and what INFORMS has done? Yeah. Okay, well, uh, I clearly was a backer yeah. of the uh, service science section. Uh, and you were I, in at the beginning of the formation I, of that was, journal, too. When right? it was begun. Uh, I've worked with uh, a number of the prominent people in this area. I have, uh, I think now my record is two papers submitted, both rejected to the service science. That's okay, I've been rejected by service science yeah, too. I, I, I've been rejected by 
<laughs> better places. <laughs> and, you know. uh, so I, you know, I'm a participant. But if you also want the other intriguing answer, yeah, how did I get in to be a? They took my badge, a fellow. Informs fellow. Informed fellow. The truth. When the fellows were formed, they automatically gave anyone who was a NAE member a pass. Yeah. That's how I got in. Yeah. Now I was involved. Okay. I I was coming to uh, meetings. Yeah. Okay. But I became. But, but you're you're. Uh interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary model, I think, for younger folks who are mm -hmm. emerging in the INFORMS community, and I think can serve as an exemplar for somebody who doesn't want to live their life in an academic silo yeah. and have a lot of different contributions. Yeah. And, and Dick, you know, just uh, discuss it in a different view. In the National Academy of Engineering, I've elected to be in Section 8. So I consider that my professional, which home. includes operations research section. It, eight. it is, uh, yeah, yes. it primarily is operations yeah. research. And and well, the name of it is manufacturing oper operations research, and is one other name. Yeah, it maybe, maybe maybe systems. Uh, yeah. So you know, I was elected into power systems. I left that. In, to be a member of the interdisciplinary group, Section 12. Yeah. And then I switched went, to switched to eight, yeah. and were um, yeah. a participant. Yeah. Uh, so, in terms of your own ident professional identity, how much of your professional identity is associated, let's say, with INFORMS versus oh. AI versus chemistry these days? Oh, or, oh, uh, like, <clears throat> chemistry, I uh, I subscribe to the journals, and just as I'm an IEEE member, I was a fellow in IEEE before I was a fellow in, in Informs. <laughs> okay, yeah. when when I was uh, director of research, I joined ASME. I'm not a mechanical engineer, so I was always involved with other activities that I was connected with, okay? Yeah. Uh, but as a participant, uh, I, I'm trying to think, I go to, I think it's three uh, technical meetings a year. PICMET, which is a engineering, uh, stands for Management of Engineering Technology. I go to INFORMS, uh, and uh, I'm a member of the meeting. Oh, this is, gives me a segue. The meeting that, tell the world, because I'm proud of what you're receiving. I'm proud of being a participant in what you're receiving, Dick. Uh, I was a founder of an organization conference called uh, information Technology and Quantitative Management, IQ. Uh, That's a very international group. Too, IQQM. Isn't it? Yeah. And this year, the meeting is in New Delhi, India, in December. And there's going to be a new award presented to Professor Richard Larson of MIT. And the medal is the Daniel Berg Medal. I, I get a chill when I say it, Dick. Uh, it was developed two years ago when Raj Reddy was the keynote speaker that I arranged. And unknown to me, he took the fee that he was getting, keynote speaker fee, and said there ought to be a medal in Dan Berg's name. And through him and friends of mine, 
including my financial advisor, including Jim Tien, including uh, the, uh, a corporation in China, including several others, raised enough money to make an endowed medal, and you are the first, but not the last, in this line. You are the initiator of this medal in December, all done by colleagues and friends of mine who did it on their own. They didn't have to do it, and they did it, and, and I'm so pleased at that, and I'm so pleased that you got selected for this. Well, I'm deeply honored. I'm yeah. deeply honored. Uh, we and, are honored. Um, looking forward to going to New yeah. Delhi with you right. on that. Why don't we close, if we could, um, because I'm a little bit embarrassed that you mentioned yeah. that. Because well, I don't want to be. I don't want to well, be. The, we can start again. I, I don't want to be the person who's interviewed. But I, that, I'm very no, deeply but, honored by that. And well, so thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. So maybe we should close by your perception of OR in the general sense. And by OR, I mean oh. the umbrella of things okay. that Informs does. What do you think it's doing best right now? And if you could change it in any direction, well, what suggestions well, might thing, you have about that? Uh, uh, when I went again to GSIA and the management course, but uh, also at RPI, my closest connection to OR is uh, the textbook that they use at RPI, mm -hmm. uh, Ecker and uh, 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 I'm trying to think of his name. Uh, the guy who's now uh, emeritus, uh, a name like Hammerschmidt. Mm -hmm. And both those guys are still teaching yeah. OR. And I have gone through a text, I know a little bit, I'm a layman mm -hmm. about OR. And, uh, but Informs does a lot more than just OR oh, now. I mean, yes. we have a, Informs does about 15 journals or so, Service Science being perhaps the most recent right. one. Yeah. So there are a lot, you know, when I go to a, an informs meeting, the issue is which session do I want to go to, yeah. okay? It, even for me. It's like a section of a city with all these different ethnic restaurants. Exactly. Yeah. And so there's a lot of choices. Uh, and I always end up, always, and there's choices there too, at the keynote talks. Because yeah. you get somebody Those are really spending good. half an hour or so yeah. with a topic. Uh, and I have a, uh, you know, <laughs> some of my best friends are ORs. Oh, that's good. That's yeah. good to hear. So is there something, uh, my, I guess my, my last question, if Informs could improve in a particular direction, do you have one recommendation in that area? Oh, boy. Or it's that's doing a, fine as far as you're concerned. And, well, you know, I've come almost every year since I've become a member. I don't know many years. If you ago. look at the size of these national exactly. meetings, it's unbelievable. I walked through yesterday, yesterday, I walked through the recruiting place and it's unbelievable. Jam packed. Jam packed with people looking from all over the world and people looking for jobs from all over the world. And today at this meeting here in Houston, we have almost 6,000 6, Informs members. Yeah. So, yeah. So, uh, whatever they're doing, they're doing a lot of I things like right. To know the recipe, I like <laughs> Dan, they're, they're obviously successful. Yeah. Dan, thank you very much for My joining us today. Yeah. And Good I'm sure, Dick. <laughs> thank you very much. You're welcome. Take care.